watermelons, and that's the, kind of the key to the whole whole uh, speech this evening. <clears throat> now, what I want to do is I want everybody to kind of get in the mood, and what, what I'm going to do, a little heads up, I write cowboy poetry, and I'm going to share probably four or five poems that kind of deal with some of the things that I'm talking about in the speech. So what I'll do is I'll intermix these uh, poems uh, throughout the speech, and I think you'll find their humor or relevant to it. And so one thing I do while we're talking about this, Bill Dudley has recorded, he's here this evening, there he is, um, he has recorded these and has posted these on YouTube. So if you would like to review them or see some other ones, Bill's done a wonderful job of editing and, and putting them on YouTube. Steve Melton, Cowboy Poetry. So in order to get people in the mood, I have brought a rocking chair. And so what I want us to use our imagination just a little bit that we're on the front porch, say, of the Overstreet House or the, maybe the, the, the country store over here. Picture yourself on that front porch on a rocking chair, and I want to quote a poem that kind of sets the tone for this evening. And imagine yourself as the sun's going down as it is, but put yourself in that mode and that will set the tone for the season. I call this the porch of peace. Come now, pull up a chair on the porch of peace. Stay and rock a while. Let your worry cease. We'll tell a few stories, maybe a joke or two. It's good to be together when the day is through. Feel that gentle breeze as it blows from the east to the west. It carries away the heat in your cares and it makes you feel a rest. We'll watch the sun go down. See the sky turning red. Quit thinking about our troubles before we go to bed. Stop. Listen to the quiet. You know, we don't hear that much anymore. We need to hear it more often. It gives our hearts and minds time to restore. So next time you're in there, you please stop and stay a while. The porch of peace will leave you with a smile. Thank you so much. Now that we're in, in the mood, we're on a rocking chair, on the front porch, I'm gonna tell a story here. A story of, of Pasco County. And many of the, uh, many are familiar with old Florida history, you know, the, uh, during the late 1800s and 1900s, there was fishing along both coastlines. Flagler and Plant had established their railroad lines. And the main population of the state was along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic. And St. John's River. A few of the rivers had some population. And there was some fishing along the coast. and, and uh, So we know about that. But what was going on in the heart of the state? What was going on in Pasco County, especially on the east side, away from the coast? People don't know what's going on in this area as much as they did the other. And at that time, around the turn of the century, the whole state was covered in trees. It was woods from one end of the state to the other, except on the Kissimmee Basin, and wet weather ponds, there was nothing but woods. And Intermixed among that were some old scrub cracker cattle, and there was some ranchers or some cowmen. This was before ranches. 
had open range cattle on this on this old scrub land with nothing but trees and they grazed on wiregrass and all the natural plants the uh, in the pine woods were thick and there'd be some grazing in wet weather ponds but the, it was all native grazing for the livestock then a big deal happened in the late 1800s and the early 1900s timber companies and the turpentine companies made a big advancement into the state i mean they came in with a huge concentrated effort to harvest the longleaf pine trees and the cypress trees that we were so familiar with here and so these timber and turpentine country companies bought out huge tracts of, of land, which was not very much. The whole wealth was in the trees and in the turpentine sap that came from this longleaf pine tree. And about the same time that this, these timber companies came in, there were big turpentine companies that came in and leased or either bought all the big tracts of, of uh, longleaf pine trees all over the state. And this harvest of this turpentine was known as naval stores. And where that came from is after they, they took the, uh, the, the rosin or, or the the sap from the turpentine tree or from the pine tree and they distilled it down into numerous different types of, of products that could be used in homes and industry and this was this was used to caulk between the planks of the wooden ships this pitch pitch from this turpentine so it just became known as naval stores. So if you ever hear the term naval stores, they're talking about turpentine products. But the turpentine was used for cleaning products, medicines, explosives, paint thinners, and have you ever heard rosin up your bow? Or that's where this came from, the rosin from the turpentine. Or what does this guy have on the pitching mound? He's got a rosin bag, doesn't he? Well, that's a sticky substance from the turpentine. And so that's, that's where all this main products, and it was, it was a huge deal. And while we're here, I would, if you get a time, the museum has a wonderful turpentine display right along that wall. It is magnificent. And so look at the tools, and they've got a couple pictures there. But... It, the reason this is important, a hundred years ago, this was the biggest industry in the state. People don't know that. It's, there, was, there was more workers and money coming in from turpentine harvest than any other product in the state. You know what that would be like? Like a hundred years from now, somebody would say, who's Mickey Mouse? Yeah, it's, it's the same deal. But this was a huge deal. So what would happen after the longleaf pine trees had kind of played out with the turpentine, they'd be cut down and sawed up for, for lumber, for tim timber. So after the turpentine and the pine trees and the cypress was all cut over. What's left? What's the land good for? Well, what you would have is you'd have some scrub oaks left, some young pine trees that were too young to harvest. You'd have some blackjack pine trees, lots of areas be palmettas, and it was just There'd be some old uh, cracker cows growing, grazed on the old land, but it was open range, so the owners couldn't 
didn't, what did it matter to them? So, what was the land worth? Almost nothing to them. So what would happen is, the turpentine companies and the timber companies would just walk off and leave the land because they've already gotten their value out of it. There's nothing left. What are they going to do with it? They would just walk off and leave it. You know what would happen? It would, it, there would be taxes from the county would be assessed to the land and nobody's paying the taxes. So what would happen oftentimes, somebody could come along and buy these big tracts of land for taxes. And sometimes the, the, uh, the timber companies or turpentine companies would actually sell the land straight to a, one that would buy it, whether it was an existing cowman or, or maybe a doctor or lawyer. And you know what it was going for? 50 cents to $2 an acre. That was all. And so what would happen is that during the 30s, the cattlemen and some others, maybe it might even be doctors and lawyers, whoever had money in the 30s decided they wanted to acquire some land, could, get, could buy huge tracts of land for very little. And so some of the doctors and lawyers and the cattlemen, they became ranchers when they acquired these vast tracts of land. And so the cracker cattle were still running on the land and it was a very poor, once, once they, these big ranchers acquired the land, what are they gonna do? Well, they just still ran some cracker cows on it, which weren't that much value, but they made a little bit. But it was still open range, and, and so this was during open range days. You know what that means? That means that you were responsible for keeping the cows out of your yard and garden. You were responsible for the city of Dade City to keep the cows out of town the government was. So what they did is they would put up cattle guards at the main roads coming into and out of town for a cattle guard. And what that was was a great big pit that they dug in the ground with some pilings on it. And across these pilings and, and timbers, they would lay big railroad rails. And so it was heavy enough to hold up trucks and cars. But the cattle would come up to that and see all of those gaps in that rails, and they wouldn't cross it. So everywhere you went during open range days, there, there were cattle guards going in and out of towns and wherever you didn't want cattle to, cattle to go. So, so that was open range days. And in 1949, the state legislature, legislature voted to shut down the open range, to close open range. In 1949, now I am 49. Within my lifetime, it's amazing to me to see that this area full of the woods and cattle grazing everywhere they wanted to went from open range to what I see today. This is astounding to me how things have developed that quickly and how, incidentally, this open range law, Florida was the last state to adopt open range, I mean to close down open range. This, Florida was wild and woolly way, way after the Wild West was tamed. So, um, so at that time when the open range was shut down, these big ranchers that had acquired these vast areas from the timber companies, or big ranches, they had to start fencing out their ranches. 
to control their ranches and their cattle into grazing. And so this is how these big ranches started in Pasco County. And I'm going to throw some names at you that, that how these ranches developed. And these ranches would be between 10,000, 15,000, a few even up to 20,000 acres. Huge. But this is how they got started, was acquiring this land from the timber companies. There was the Barthel Ranch out at St. Joe, San Ann area. Um, there was the, the Cruzen family towards Zephyr Hills. There was Wiregrass Porter toward New Tampa area on the road to nowhere. A few people know about that. <laughs> there was the Larkin family right over here, went all the way down to 98. There was Wiregrass Porter back over there and uh, also around that area. And um, Starkey, he's in Pasco County. He was over there in Newport Ritchie area. He had a huge ranch over there, which is starting to be developed. And then there was the Wayne Thomas ranches. There was one here in Spring Lake area and all of the Two Rivers Ranch, a lot of it in Pasco County, was acquired at this time. In fact, Wayne Thomas donated the Hillsborough State Park out of the, his ranch. And so these were vast areas there. And then there was some others that I harvest seed for that's not very far from here. There's the Rooks's up toward Lake Lindsay, uh, Inverness area. They had huge amounts of area. Um, there was the Bell family in, in Bushnell. And then there was the Bailey family out of Sumter County, Bushnell, uh, Oxford area. And the Bailey family is kind of interesting. That, that was a huge holding. And that is where the villages started. We have Mary Lee here that has come down from the villages tonight. Thank you, Mary Lee. And she is living where Bullhole used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we have... That's how the villages got started from this from these big ranches that had, had started. But Pasco County was mostly trees. Then how did it get converted from these trees to all these green pastures and fields you see around here? The main thing that changed this was watermelons. Watermelons was the great changing impetus of all of Florida going from trees to improved pasture. Who would have thought watermelons had such a big impact on the state? But they did. In the late 40s and the 50s, Florida found an early market for watermelons. They could plant in February and have those melons come in hopefully before or right about the time of the memorial holiday picnics all up and down the, the eastern seaboard, all up into New England. Florida was the main only game in town that could produce melons Real early. We have a gentleman here with, with Butch Bryant who grows watermelons today who said that is still in, in, in effect, is growing, getting these crops of melons in before the, the Memorial Day. So they found that we could grow watermelons here early.
Now, where are they going to plant watermelons? There was a little bit of farmland scattered around Pasco County here. But you cannot grow watermelons on old ground. This is, this is what people didn't understand at the time. Because of the disease that is left over from the previous crop, if you planted watermelons in the same field that you planted last year, within just a little while, if you're Syrian wilt and all of these diseases, pathogens will get on the plants and they will not make it. So watermelons have to be planted on new ground. Well, how do you get new ground? Well, you take some big D7 bulldozers with root rakes and blades on them, and you start pushing up the trees to create new ground for these watermelons. This meant that new that the melons had to be replanted on new ground every year. So melon man might plant 100 acres of melons this year, but he's going to need to push up another 100 acres of, of woods for next year. So what, what they started doing, the melon growers at the time, and this is in the early 50s, they would go to these big ranchers. What was on their ranch? Nothing but woods. And you think the rancher wanted some improved pasture? Well, yeah. So he, so the, here was the deal. The melon man would go to the rancher and say, I need 100 acres of, of ground to plant melons on. And they'd write, okay, here's your 100 acres. So, they, so the melon man said, I will plant the melons. I'll push all the, all the trees up, pick up the roots, plant the melons, and I want a little additional kick. I want an Alice clover crop that would fall in right behind the melons as a catch crop. It'll be harvested in the fall. I'll disc it all up and give you a cleared, nice seed bed for a new pasture. And that was the trade. So the growers would, would clear all the land and one of the things that I wanted to back up just a little bit, well, how do people grow watermelons today? I want to touch on this just a minute. Butch Bryant's here. He's, he, he's a big watermelon grower in, in the town in Dade City here. Well, there's no more woods to push up, so how are you going to do this? You can either put it on old Bahia grass pasture, which helps, but what Butch does now, they have developed ways to lay plastic down, and they've got all of these more uh, fungicide sprays, which will keep the disease under control. They can control their, their water very efficiently with drip irrigation now, so Butch even is growing watermelons on old pushed up groves. So that's one little uh, thing that we can see that's how melons are grown now. But back then, you couldn't do it. And a couple of the old varieties of melons, have any of you old guys ever heard of Charleston Grays? Cannonballs, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the melons that started out with. So, so after the melons were off, then the melon beds were disc up, and then they would pick up the roots again and lay and, and plant Alice clover. My dad started out harvest with melons. That's how he got his first start. And then he started harvesting the Alice Clover. But as a kid, I remember picking up roots all my life. It was, it was so hard. You know, I'm you know, up to 10 years old, I'm picking up roots, throwing them on the wagon. Well, it was, that was what was done to get the, mel to get the clover land ready for the melons. And so, um, 
Alice Clover, by the way, is was the hay crop of the South back then. It was almost like alfalfa. It's a wonderful hay crop. It's a legume and was wonderful for hay, but we harvested it for seed for other people to plant also. And um, so I want to quote a poem to, to you now about a couple of guys that, that Dad had hired um, that were picking up, that were disking up this land for the Alice Clover after melons were over. So let me find it in my book here just a minute. Now. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Um, this this title of this poem is entitled "The Cousins," and what Dad did. We had just one little old farm oil tractor to disc all of this mountain land in and to get the land prepared for planting the Alice Clover. Just one disc and one tractor. So in order to get it all done, Dad hired two, uh, two, two local teenagers or in their 20s to run the tractor. One had the night shift and one had the other one. And uh, during the day, and so this was Cabell Dees had a farm out on the other side of Trilby here, and he had a son named Lamar, and he had a cousin named George, who lived in Zephyr Hills. But they teamed up together to run this tractor. Now, a funny incident happened one evening to, uh, to Lamar and George, and I'd like to quote this to you at the time. Back in the late 50s, Dad was disking up some land for the clover. We planted it behind the melons after the picking was over. With one farm all tractor, it would have to run nonstop. Dad hired two neighbor boys to help plant, disk and plant the crop. George and Lamar were cousins. So different it was a sight. George loved his motorcycle. Lamar liked to date, get home late at night. They got along well together, but there developed a bit of a rift because Lamar dissed during the day and George got the nighttime shift. Days later, George was hungry and tired. He'd driven that tractor through the night. The next morning, Lamar was a no-show. It made him so mad he wanted to fight. Lamar finally got there. It seems he'd overslept. George told him a few choice words, and on his motorcycle he leapt. He fired that bike off and shot a rooster tail way up into the air. And by the time he got across that field, he was going faster than anybody's would dare. Just then, Lamar remembered to tell him something. And it happened as he feared. Looking across that field, a great cloud of dust appeared. Lamar's unusual decision that morning affected poor George's fate. For the first time that week, he shut the barbed wire gate. At the last minute, George saw the 
barbed wire, and he turned and laid that motorcycle down, and you should have seen the dirt fly when that cycle hit the ground. Later all was forgiven. It could have been much worse by far, but 50 years later, George tells everyone, never do the night shift with Cousin Lamar. <laughs> Thank you. So, so these big ranches um, started uh, clearing the land and uh, for, for this new pasture. And what would happen as, as the melons moved down across his ranch, he had this beautiful seed bed. What's he going to plant? Well, about that time, Argentine and Pensacola bahia grass were just introduced to the state. A new, improved grass. So the rancher planted that and improved his, his ranch and now he could increase his cow herd and have more cattle on his ranch. And as you drive through the fields, I mean, Anywhere you go across the state and you look out and you see these pastures, 90% of it is, is bahia grass. It's in your yards. It's on the roadside. It is the most prolific grass in the state, and it's a wonderful grass that, that cattle like to eat it and it does good for them. So, we, so these ranchers started started planting these fields and not only would they get extra extra money for the increased cattle, they learned to start holding some of that bahia grass seed for seed production. And that's where we came in. We had a heart combines and harvest company and we started harvesting bahia grass for these ranches. And one of the ranches that, that comes to mind was, was the K-Bar Ranch, south of Zephyr Hills a little bit, owned by Henry Douglas, who had married Cruzen's daughter. And so Henry had this big ranch here, and um, I'd like to quote you another point that actually happened, and it was told to me by Mike Douglas, one of the guys that worked there. And I couldn't believe it. And his wife was sitting there agreeing to everything he was saying. And I would like to share this poem with you. This is true cracker cowboy poetry. And I call it the steer. Down at the K Bar Ranch, the breeding season was done. They gathered in all the bulls. That is all but one. He was a big Brahma bull. He weighed more than a ton. He didn't want to leave his ladies. He was having too much fun. The cowboys came back with ropes from the trailer to show him who was boss. Little did they know this was a line he would never cross. Cooter took to him first but hit a ditch and rolled his horse. Got banged up really bad when he hit the ground with all that force. Mike and Greg finally got him triggered and backed up to the pen. Little they know the real trouble was just about to begin. They pushed him out of the trailer, but he doubled back quicker than a switchblade knife. Put Greg on top of the trailer, scrambling for his life. Somehow he got into the barnyard and decided he would roam. He trotted across the field straight to Mike's mobile home. He jumped up on the front porch where there were flowers hanging in pots of terracotta. He started butting and swinging at them, just like he would a pinata. Mike ran past the beast to tell his wife not to go outside. A minute later, that bull busted through the front door of that single wide. They barely escaped to the back porch. Scared and somewhat shaken, 
They couldn't believe how their home had just now been overtaken. Back in the house, mud manure oozing across the floor. But what made Tina really mad? He slobbered all over the sliding glass door. Mike called the owner. A bull is in, in my kitchen. What should I do with this plea? Henry Douglas said. Thinking it was a joke, Henry said, Well, why don't you serve him up some tea? That bull finally went back out the front door and straight to his herd he made a straight track. But he busted up three of the fences before he made it back. All the cowboys gathered up. They had a meeting to lay their fears. And then it was all agreed. Why don't we extend the breeding season at least for two more years? <laughs> that happened. True story. That's my favorite. So as we get back to on the, the melons, um, the melon growers in this area um, were the Towns and Company out here at Richland, Frank Tomko at Trilby, Dad here on west of Trilby. Um, there was the uh, the Battens in Spring Lake area did some in Pasco County. The Messicks, I don't know if you've ever heard that name, they grew a lot of melons. And uh, so most of them would ship out of the railroad uh, sidings at Trilby, at Dade City, and some at at Croom. Anywhere there was a there was a railroad siding, they'd load melons under the boxcars. And hundreds.